It almost smelled like he was rotting from the inside. And I turn to go into the subdivision, and I black out. He was just visibly dehydrated. He wouldn't even cry at that point. Linda was collapsed, unconscious on the floor, next to the butcher knife. I kind of thought, whatever it is, they don't understand it. Next, two medical mysteries that defied the experts. For more than a year, little Avery Conley has suffered from violent bouts of vomiting and diarrhea. As doctor after doctor insist that he simply has a run-of-the-mill virus, his parents seem to be the only ones who understand just how deadly his condition may be. Something is so wrong with him that, that we're going to lose the little guy. Then, Linda Smith doesn't think too much about her agonizing migraines. In fact, she thinks she's got them under control until she begins experiencing terrifying blackouts and puts her family's lives in danger. I thought, my God, I could have gotten us killed. I can't ignore this. When illness strikes, we look to doctors to give us answers. But what if they can't? For these unlucky patients, diagnosis is a mystery. Jamie and Robert Conley are ecstatic when their second child, Avery, is born on January 22, 2003 in Dallas, Texas. Now big sister Emily has a little brother to play with. But soon after they bring Avery home, the Conleys realize that he's much more fussy when it comes to feeding than Emily had been. He did uh, have reflux. He cried all the time, nonstop. It didn't matter what we did. He always seemed to be in pain. Jamie, a seasoned mom, suspects her newborn is just suffering from severe colic and hopes it will pass. But after a few weeks, Avery doesn't seem to be getting any better, so she decides to take him to see the doctor. He suggests that Avery may just have a sensitive stomach and encourages Jamie to try formula. The doctors asked that we please try the dairy-based formulas, and that's when all of the trouble started. We were sitting on the couch, and I was feeding Avery, and I had fed him only one ounce. It felt like 10 ounces came back out shooting across the room. You could tell that it wasn't a normal spit up from after a child eating. It was a projectile. If you'd been across the room, you'd been hit. Um, it came up with such force that it literally would almost knock you off your feet. And it's quite scary watching such a small little baby vomit with such intensity that his stomach just almost literally looked like it was turning inside out. Well, we called the doctor right away, and they didn't, they didn't seem all that concerned. It was, oh, mom, it's probably just a virus. But the virus doesn't go away. In fact, the vomiting only gets worse. And less than 24 hours after it started, another symptom suddenly emerges. Within a day of the projectile vomiting, the pure water diarrhea started. Actually, almost projectile stools. When you're changing them, you better be quick. Um, changing the diapers was not always fun. <laughs> um, it, it wasn't normal for an infant to have stool like that. The smell from his diaper area was just absolutely horrible. It almost smelled like he was, he was rotting from the inside. The Conleys have never seen anything like it before. Frightened by the bizarre symptom, they take eight-week-old Avery back to see the doctor. They're convinced he isn't suffering from any ordinary virus. This time, the doctor performs a head-to-toe examination, but finds little in the way of abnormalities. He then suggests that Avery may simply have an allergy to dairy products. The doctor suggested soy-based formula because some infants have better luck with that. 
the first feeding, we thought, oh, great, it's working, because he didn't throw it all back up. But the second feeding, we knew something was wrong because the same exact symptoms started over again. If he ate four ounces, at least two of it was coming back out. It was very difficult to watch him go through this, knowing that he's in pain and knowing that something's not quite right, but not really being able to do anything about it except try to hug him and hold him more. Robert and Jamie can't bear to see their son living in such agony. So, once again, they call their doctor looking for some answers. And once again, they're told not to worry. Avery just needs some time to adjust to the new formula. But when he starts to develop an acute diaper rash, Robert knows his son needs help fast. His diaper rash was so bad that he actually had open sores. No amount of cream or paste or anything we could put on it would help. We'd have to keep him wrapped up in a towel for a few days until his skin would heal, that we could put a diaper back on him. He's looking pretty bad. His color's changed. He's a little bit whiter. Um, he looks more emaciated. He's acting much more lethargic. And it's really starting to make us nervous that maybe something is so wrong with him that, that we're going to lose the little guy before we can figure out what's wrong. Avery Conley is only four months old and has suffered from chronic projectile vomiting and diarrhea since the day his parents brought him home. Doctors are convinced that Avery just has a sensitive stomach and prescribe a soy-based formula to relieve his symptoms. But just five days after they make the switch, Jamie witnesses a shocking and terrifying new symptom. Jamie goes to pick up Avery and he's just totally not responsive. We can't wake him up. Um, nothing we try to do can seem to wake him up. It's just like he's permanently asleep. In a state of panic, Jamie and Robert race their newborn son to the closest ER. As soon as they enter the hospital, nurses begin taking his vitals, and Jamie recounts exactly what's been happening to her son since the day he was born. I explained in detail that he had the projectile vomiting, the pure water diarrhea, and the diaper rash. He was just visibly dehydrated and lethargic. He wouldn't even cry at that point. Given Avery's medical history, the ER physician immediately calls in a pediatric specialist. Finally, Jamie believes someone will be able to give her a definitive diagnosis. The pediatric gastroenterologist came in the room and asked just a very few basic questions, wasn't even in depth. Got a stool sample and left the room. But her hopes are short-lived. And he came back in and said, okay, well, we'll send him home and, and just keep an eye on him. And if anything happens, follow up with the regular doctor. And we kind of sat there baffled as to what was that all about? The doctor believes that Avery is suffering from a severe viral infection, but they'll have to wait until the results from the stool sample test come back to know for sure. Jamie and Robert head home and anxiously wait for the news. We got the phone call that says the results were negative, that it was not a virus. The doctor reiterates the same advice they've heard too many times before, that whatever's plaguing their son will run its course. They just need to give it some time. But over the next week, it's becoming very clear to the Conleys that Avery's health is declining at a startling rate. He's getting worse day by day. We can't wake him up for anything. And it almost takes two of us to bathe him because one of them has to hold to keep the child from drowning because he won't wake up and they don't think anything's wrong with him. 
Even more disheartening, doctors aren't the only ones doubting the Conley's grave concern. Our family was just more of, no, it's a virus, or no, I, I, you know, maybe Jamie and Robert are really making, making this up, or they're blowing it out of proportion. And after four months of managing Avery's bizarre symptoms alone, the stress is becoming almost too much for the couple to bear. It was very difficult working all the time, being gone from the family and coming home. Uh, Jamie's emotional state is getting worse. So I was basically handling all of this by myself, trying to handle feeding Avery, making sure I'm still paying attention to Emily and letting her know that she's still loved, even though Avery is sick. When Avery turns 24 weeks old, Jamie finally breaks down and takes him back to the pediatrician. This time, she's more determined than ever to leave the doctor's office with an answer. But the doctor, still convinced that Avery has a sensitive stomach, suggests that Jamie try feeding him a special hydrolyzed baby formula. Hydrolyzed formula is pre-digested with enzymes, so it's easier for the stomach to digest. For the first few days, he actually started to improve. You could see that he was a, a little, little bit happier by the day. He was becoming happy again, and he wasn't afraid to eat anymore. It took a couple of feedings for him to realize that it wasn't going to just hurt his stomach when he ate. While there is a marked improvement in Avery's overall health, he's still occasionally throwing up. Food allergies still seem to be a likely culprit, so the pediatrician sends Avery to an allergist so they can run a few tests. The nurse practitioner ordered the blood tests to test for food allergies and common allergens and things of that nature. The two week wait to get the allergy results were just awful because this whole time, you know, again, you're kind of doubting yourself in the back of your mind thinking, is it something that we're doing? When the results finally arrive, they are nothing short of shocking. He says, well, it's really strange. He has no food allergies. So we really don't know what's going on, but just stay with the hydrolyzed formula. At yet another dead end, the Conleys can only continue to feed Avery the specialized formula. At least he can keep most of it down. When he turns eight months old, though, Jamie begins transitioning him to solid foods, hopeful that Avery will finally be able to eat trouble-free. When we introduced solids to Avery, we started with cereal. And the first feeding was okay, there were no symptoms. And the second feeding, some of it came back out and we thought, well, maybe it's just the reflux kicking in because his stomach's learning what to do. And then by the third feeding, it all came just right back out. He just vomited the whole meal up. It's a decisive moment for the Conleys, and they agree that the first step in finding a diagnosis for their son's perplexing condition hinges on the next decision that they make. We were bound to determine to figure this out if we had to on our own. Basically, we're firing our doctor. Jamie and Robert Conley have been struggling to find someone who can help figure out what is causing Avery, their 10-month-old son, to suffer from chronic vomiting and diarrhea. Growing more and more distressed, the couple has finally decided to take matters into their own hands. I started to do research on the internet and find groups on the internet and talk to other moms. And I, I probably did at least 200 hours of research And then, while the family is visiting relatives in Oklahoma, something happens that will change the Conleys' lives forever. We went for a drive, and I remember to this day seeing the billboard, and it says, OU Children's Physicians, Dr. John Gruno. And when we got home, 
she did some research into what his specialty was and its gastroenterology. We're living in Louisville, Texas, which is about three hours and 45 minutes away from Oklahoma. We pretty much packed up and left. I'm a mechanic, I can get a job anywhere. I was concerned. What if the doctor was not able to help them, then they just moved from another state for nothing. Three months after first seeing that man on the billboard, Jamie finally meets pediatric gastroenterologist, Dr. Gruno. Well, Jamie was really very frustrated because Avery had had problems since birth and no one seemed to take the time to listen to her. For the first time in more than a year, the Conleys are hopeful as Dr. Gruno goes over every symptom that Avery has been experiencing. The combination of severe bouts of vomiting and diarrhea lead him to suspect that the culprit may be Avery's digestive tract. He immediately orders a colonoscopy, a risky procedure for a one-year-old child. To do a colonoscopy requires sedation, and the risk is primarily with the sedation itself. Uh, there's also the possible risk of poking a hole through the wall of the colon. That should be a very serious complication. So there is risk involved with doing colonoscopy. As the Conleys wait for Avery's colonoscopy appointment, Jamie follows up on Dr. Gruno's hunch. She's burning up the keyboard, typing in symptoms, hoping that something will pop up. There was a specific diagnosis in there that met our symptoms that we hadn't looked into yet because it is extremely rare to have. The next week, Avery undergoes the colonoscopy. And as part of the procedure, Dr. Gruno takes a sample of his intestinal wall and sends it to the lab. When it's over, Jamie makes a special request. At the end, in the recovery room, I said, Dr. Gruno, can you test for this disease? I, I really, I just think, I just know. Dr. Gruno agrees to the testing. And when the results come back two weeks later, Jamie's suspicions are confirmed. The biopsies, in fact, uh, did show a much larger than usual number of mast cells. The elevation of uh, these cells, the increased numbers, led me to think that, in fact, what we were dealing with is a form of mastocytosis. Mastocytosis is a rare disorder characterized by the presence of too many mast cells, which are found in the skin, lining of the stomach, and intestines. Mast cells are a type of regulatory cell. They have many different functions. Uh, people associate them primarily with allergic reactions. Mast cells play an important role in helping your immune system defend the body from disease by releasing chemical alarms, such as histamine, to tell the immune system to attack invading pathogens. But if you have too many mast cells, too much histamine can be released, causing the surrounding tissue to become inflamed. The mast cell in and of itself uh, is, is not too much of an issue, but when it becomes activated, uh, it releases a variety of different chemicals the things that tend to activate mast cells are allergens, pollens, different foods. Because of the large number of mast cells in the intestinal tract, uh, there are many symptoms that would accrue. Diarrhea, uh, vomiting would be a common symptom. Abdominal pain is common as well. And Avery certainly had his share of the diarrhea and the vomiting. Dr. Gruno goes on to explain that Avery's diarrhea and vomiting can in turn result in a total lack of energy making Avery chronically unresponsive and literally putting his life in danger. If the diarrhea persists and you can't take enough food in, it's inevitable that one would die of starvation, be severely dehydrated. Uh, all these are very serious complications. But one key question remains. If Avery's mast cells were reacting to food allergens, why did he come up negative on all the allergy tests? In traditional allergy, there is an antibody, and when you do allergy testing, that's actually what you are measuring. In mastocytosis, that antibody is not there in large quantities. 
Though Jamie is relieved that Avery finally has a diagnosis, she still has a hard time understanding why none of the other doctors could connect the dots. Well, mastocytosis is not very common at all. It's one of those diseases we call an orphan disease, uh, since there are fewer than 200,000 people in the entire United States who have manifestation of this disease. And if you are not specifically looking for it, you will never find it. While doctors continue to research a cure for this rare disorder, patients like Avery are being treated with a new prescription medication. It stabilizes that membrane of mast cells so that it cannot release the histamine. In addition, Avery must stay on a very restricted diet. He has to avoid food that sensitizes his mast cells, like dairy, egg, and cheese. Today, Avery is three years old, and with the proper treatment, he is thriving. Avery is a normal, rambunctious four-year-old. All those doctor's visits were not because I had nothing better to do or I was over-worried. There is something wrong. You can never discount what a mother says. A mother knows her child better than anyone else. She may overstate the symptoms that she's seen. She may understate the symptoms that she's seen, but she knows what those symptoms are. While Avery Conley was lucky enough to have his diagnosis discovered within the first few years of his life, Linda Smith spent more than 20 years tortured by strange and life-threatening symptoms that no doctor could identify. Linda was born to a humble farm family in southern Minnesota. She was a strong little girl who learned the value of hard work at an early age. But when Linda hits puberty, her body begins to change in ways that she never expected. I started just being very fatigued, lightheaded, dizzy, weak very weak. By the end of the morning chores, uh, I would be very sick. Despite her strange symptoms, Linda keeps them to herself. When you're one of 10 kids, you don't go to the doctor for every little sniffle. You just don't. If you had a headache, or if you were nauseous, or if you were coming down with the flu, you were still expected to get your chores done. Linda does her best to manage her symptoms through the rest of her adolescence. And when she turns 18, she decides to leave the Minnesota cold and farm life for the bustle of Los Angeles. But almost as soon as she touches down in California, a new and very unexpected symptom begins to emerge. I started to notice migraines. It was very dramatic. It was almost like when I got off the plane, I could feel something's different. They were immense. Uh, they were off the charts immense. It made it very difficult for me to focus. Linda's chronic migraines, along with her dizziness and fatigue, make it next to impossible to concentrate on her new job. Desperate for some relief, she makes an appointment with a neurologist. He immediately orders a CAT scan to see if there's anything unusual about her brain. But the results come back normal. And he said, you know, everything looks fine. Um, you know, you, you are in Los Angeles. Uh, we are smog capital of the world. Maybe you have a sensitivity to the smog. Linda resolves to manage her symptoms on her own and begins to experiment with various over-the-counter medications, but none of them seem to help. The headaches were still very intense. Just exhaustion, I felt exhausted. I really felt like I needed to get a better handle on my health situation. I thought, it's time for a change. Linda decides she's had enough of the smoldering LA heat and smog and moves back home to Minnesota. When she walks out of the airport and the frigid air hits her, something odd happens. Immediately, the headaches were gone. I mean, it was dramatic. It was like, oh my gosh, um, where are the headaches? Linda is completely taken aback by the sudden improvement in her health. And as soon as she's feeling up to par, she decides to try living on her own one more time. After just three months in Minnesota, she packs her bags again and heads to sunny Florida. 
As soon as I get into Florida and I get out of my car, it's like, wow, they're back. The headaches came back. They were at least 10 times more severe than any of the headaches that I even had in Los Angeles. Despite the return of her dreaded migraines, Linda sucks it up and tries her best to manage them with pain relievers. She perseveres, and soon after landing a job, she meets Dan Smith. I was working for a delivery company, and Linda was one of the secretaries at a business that I delivered to. And a short time after that, we began dating. Linda is happier than she's ever been, and a year later, they announce their engagement. I really was excited about meeting her because she was marrying my brother, who I love very much, and I immediately fell in love with Linda. It isn't long before Dan notices Linda's headaches, but she assures him that they're nothing to worry about. Linda was never interested in seeing a doctor. Um, going to a physician was not on high up on her list. But then Dan picks up on something that suggests Linda could be worse off than either of them realize. One day we were out for a long walk and we came back to our apartment. And as we walked up the flight of stairs, I noticed that Linda's pulse was quite fast. And I stopped and asked her if I could take her pulse rate. It was running so fast I had a hard time counting it. When I asked her about it, I was kind of surprised at her response. I asked Dan, well, this has happened to you, right? This, this happens to you, right? He says, mm, no, it doesn't. She was in great shape, and she really was, and she worked out every day. It didn't make sense that her heart rate was running so fast by walking up a flight of stairs. Linda Smith has experienced crushing migraines, extreme dizziness, and fatigue since she was 12 years old. But every doctor she's been to has reassured her that she has nothing to be concerned about. And so, Linda hasn't worried. But when her husband sees her pulse skyrocket after climbing a single flight of stairs, he insists that she see another doctor. She took my blood pressure and my heart rates, and she said, you know, something's definitely not right here. But I would like to run an EKG and uh, see how this test turns out. And just coincidentally, I, I had spoken with my mother and explained what was happening to Linda, and she asked whether or not there was any chance that Linda might be pregnant. She explained that she had had some scenarios herself where her heart rate changed when she was pregnant. So uh, Dan went and got an EPT test, and sure enough, I'm pregnant. So uh, I called the doctor back and explained to her it's a positive test, and we decided that EKG was no longer necessary. The Smiths eagerly await the birth of their first child. But at six months, Linda begins to experience some unusual cramping and makes an appointment with her obstetrician. Then, after a brief examination, the doctor delivers some devastating news. We sat down and he said, you know, I just want you to know that you're very young, uh, you're healthy, and you and your husband can try again. I was devastated. And I remember calling my husband and telling him, we're losing the baby. You know, I asked, what went wrong? You know, I took my prenatal vitamins. I drank plenty of fluids. What happened? And he said, what we think may have happened in your case is that the baby just didn't get enough oxygen or blood volume. And uh, it wasn't enough to take care of it. I couldn't comprehend that. Linda and Dan start out on the slow road to recovery. And just three months later, they begin trying to conceive another child, despite the fact that Linda's migraines, dizziness, and lightheadedness are the worst they've ever been. I was very uh, afraid that maybe I could never have kids. 
This is a dream of mine. I wanted to be a housewife and a mother and uh, to have a large family. I knew something was wrong, but I kept thinking about what the doctors in Los Angeles had told me. Don't worry about it. Uh, try not to think about it. It'll get better. Linda does her best to push through her painful symptoms. And when she and Dan find out they're pregnant in March of 1987, they're overjoyed. She was ecstatic, and so was I. I'm like, this is, this is great. Um, hopefully, everything will work out with this pregnancy. And in November of 1987, she gives birth to her beautiful daughter, Christina. But within the first 48 hours after Christina's birth, Linda's symptoms take a dramatic turn for the worse. Uh, she felt dizzy again, uh, started to have some situations where she felt like she couldn't hold the baby. She couldn't walk, you know, she was um, falling over, very dizzy, woozy. She just was totally wasted. But Linda believes she just needs some time to recover after giving birth. She decides to take it easy until she regains her strength. And then, one day a few weeks later, she ventures outside for the first time since Christina was born. This one afternoon, um, I decided I'm, I'm going to take Christina, and uh, we're going shopping. I hadn't done that in a while. It's a very warm day out. And I'm thinking, gosh, I could fall asleep. I'm just exhausted. And I turn to go into the subdivision. And when I do, I black out. And I come to only moments before. Linda Smith is only 25, but has suffered from agonizing migraines, chronic dizziness, and a dangerously high heart rate since she was an adolescent. Despite her family's concerns, Linda has resigned herself to living with her symptoms until she passes out while driving with her newborn baby in the back seat, narrowly avoiding a head-on collision. I was stunned. I was absolutely stunned. I thought, my God, I could have gotten us killed. I can't ignore this. Linda immediately makes appointments with a team of cardiologists and neurologists who promise her that they will get to the bottom of her terrifying episodes. But while they search for a diagnosis, the blackouts, or what the medical experts call syncope, continue. It was happening quite frequently. And if I stood, sometimes I would only stand for 15 to 20 seconds, and I'd be in a gray out and very quickly afterwards, I'd pass out. Over the next several weeks, Linda is in and out of the hospital as she undergoes a battery of medical tests. While they can't seem to identify what's causing her heart rate to randomly race out of control, they suggest a drastic measure to help regulate it. And he said, you know, I don't know what this is, but uh, we, we really may need to consider being a pacemaker implant Although the pacemaker could control her heart rate and help suppress the blackouts, Linda is horrified by the thought of having one. 80-year-olds have pacemakers, not 25-year-olds. I felt old. Linda is on the fence about having the pacemaker surgically implanted. But one evening, while making dinner, the choice becomes crystal clear. And I go out to the kitchen, and I had taken some meat out of the refrigerator, and I got a carving knife out to cut the meat up. I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get sick. And I turned around, and just as I turned around, I passed out cold. I walked into the kitchen and saw my daughter in her high chair, and Linda was collapsed and uh, unconscious on the floor. Next to Linda was the butcher knife. 
this was the confirmation to me to go ahead and have a pacemaker implant. Two days later, Linda is rolled into the OR for the surgery. And almost immediately afterwards, her life begins to change. I get up and uh, I use the restroom and I look in the mirror. I have a glow in my face. I thought, oh my gosh, this is what I look like with pink in my face. After the pacemaker was put in for um, a long time, Linda saw a really marked difference in what was happening to her. Her episodes of passing out really went away. Over the next few years, Linda and Dan have two more children. And despite her very busy life juggling her family's schedules, Linda is able to manage her migraines, dizziness, and fatigue one day at a time. I'm able to get a pretty good handle on some of the other symptoms. I start to uh, drink more fluid, and uh, I start to take frequent rest periods throughout the day. But on a very hot summer afternoon in 1993, Linda's world is once again turned upside down. One day I decided I'm gonna mow the yard. And I'm about halfway through when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I get this immense pain that shoots across my chest, goes down my left arm, up my neck, and into my left side of my face. And I get into the uh, house, and I, I call Dan at work, and I said, Dan, I'm really not well. You need to come home. And I pass out while speaking to him on the phone. Dan rushes Linda to the ER. And his sister, Mary Ellen, a registered nurse, meets them there. Their fear at the time is that the pacemaker has simply stopped working. I went out and I spoke with the nurses at the desk. I said, I'm really worried about my sister-in-law. She's having chest pain and her blood pressure is really low. Can somebody help her? They just, <laughs> they just kind of rolled their eyes, essentially, and didn't really respond. Linda is discharged the next day without any diagnosis, referral, or prescription. And I was getting very frustrated to the point where I kind of thought there's no real purpose in going back to another physician. They just don't understand this. Whatever it is, they don't understand it. Linda Smith has been enduring myriad painful symptoms for almost as long as she can remember. But when her blackouts suddenly reappear without warning, the doctors have no answers for her. Linda is so discouraged, she swears off the medical establishment for good. But with Dan's encouragement, she reluctantly agrees to go to one last appointment with a team of specialists at Vanderbilt University. Within a month, Linda and Dan board a plane headed for Nashville. Dr. David Robertson is now in charge of Linda's case. Well, I came by her room soon after she arrived, having heard that litany of problems that she had faced. He sits down with us and he explains what tests they're gonna run. And I, I think, let's do it. Dr. Robertson's goal is to try to figure out why Linda's heart rate and blood pressure are so variable. The body regulates blood pressure and heart rate so that they are at the appropriate level while you're lying down, while you're seated, and while you're standing. And that level must be high enough that all the blood can get right up to the brain. First, Dr. Robertson gives Linda a specialized exam called a tilt table test in the hope that it'll shed light on her abnormal heart rate. The head of that tilt table gradually goes up as we are monitoring blood pressure and heart rate to give us the full picture of what the heart is experiencing at that time. 
The test confirms that Linda's blood pressure and heart rate hit shockingly high levels when her head is elevated. Normally, the heart rate might need to go up 10 beats per minute to keep blood going to the brain where it needs to be. In Linda's case, there was an immediate increase in her heart rate of 32 beats. And moreover, the blood pressure had to rise also. Next, Dr. Robertson begins conducting a test to monitor Linda's catecholamine levels. Catecholamines are a type of neurotransmitter released from the nervous system to regulate heart rate and blood pressure. What we then did was to assess the catecholamines during our tests on the tilt table. We found that they were extremely elevated, and this confirmed the nature of her problem. It really had to be orthostatic intolerance. Orthostatic intolerance, or OI, is a condition caused by a defective autonomic nervous system, the system that controls involuntary body functions, like digestion, blood flow, and body temperature. Patients with OI can't make necessary adjustments to counteract gravity when standing up, and blood from their heart, lungs, and brain pool into their lower extremities, causing a drop in blood pressure. Suddenly, all of Linda's symptoms make sense. If the blood flow to the brain is impaired, a great many symptoms can emerge, like fatigue, rapid heart rate, migraine, headaches. Some people with orthostatic intolerance will have the feeling like you're going to pass out. That's quite common. But there were times when Linda completely lost consciousness. That is very dangerous if you are in situations where you can harm yourself. And finally, Linda and Dan can understand why they lost their first child. It's possible that uh, there can be loss of a fetus. If blood flow to the fetus is not maintained, we can't be sure um, in this case if that was a factor uh, in uh, the problem that uh, Linda experienced. But it could have been. I remember when he left the room. Sorry. Thanking God, thank you. Thank you, Father in heaven. Thank you. I was so relieved. It was over. It was over. I had a diagnosis that I thought I can start to regain my life. I don't have to put my kids at risk anymore. I can work with this. I can do it. While Linda feels a definite sense of relief after suffering for more than two decades, she can't help but wonder, why did it take most of her life to get diagnosed? The difficulty in evaluating someone with these kinds of symptoms is that each symptom could have many different explanations. The good news is that while there is no cure for orthostatic intolerance, it can be managed. There are drugs which reduce the excessive stimulation of the heart. There's one more crucial thing Linda can do to maintain her health. Since excessive heat can raise a person's heart rate, this can be especially dangerous for people with OI. The heat in Florida is only exacerbating Linda's problem. So we made the decision that we would move back to Minnesota, where Linda's from originally. A climate that was better suited for Linda would be better suited for all of us. Today, Linda's kids are almost all grown up, and she and Dan have dedicated their lives to helping others cope with this little-known condition through their National Dysautonomia Research Foundation. I thought if you could start an organization that would help to give patients the ability to reach out to other patients, would be very helpful. There are a large number of people that are impacted and can't find adequate care. And there were times I wanted to give up and uh, not persevere. I knew if I did that, I was gonna put my children in harm's way, myself in harm's way, and quite possibly complete strangers in harm's way. And I couldn't do that.